Okay, so in this section, I want to start with talking a little about the structure of typical convolutional neural networks. So let's start with a picture of AlexNet, which is this eight layer neural network. And you'll see that the layers are kind of divided into two types. In the first part, we start with a set of convolutional layers and these take 2D inputs with some channels and I'm going to talk through all the parts in the convolutional layers. Then it gets flattened and it ends up with what are called fully connected layers which are basically very similar to the types of layers that we saw in the earlier neural network. So let me go walk through each of these types. So before we do that we have to understand something called a tensor. And a tensor in convolutional neural network lingo is really just a multi-dimensional array. So for example, an array of numbers that could have say a depth, height, and width. Unknowingly, perhaps, you have actually seen many examples already of tensors. So for example, a grayscale image is just a matrix of values or pixel values, height and width. So that would just be a two dimensional uh, tensor. But if you took a color image, there's actually a, um, an, a matrix for each color channel. So it would be height, width by channel, and there are three of these channels, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. So this would be a three dimensional tensor. Now, if you took a batch of images, you would have another index for the sample. So you would have a fourth dimensional tensor. So, for example, if I had 100 color images of 256 by 384, its shape would be 100 for the sample, 256 by 384 for the size, and three channels. So a fourth dimensional tensor. Now, you will also hear the term calling this a fourth order tensor or even a rank for tensor. Of course, rank means something different in linear algebra. So we're going to either use dimension or order here to be clear. All right, let's go back to that AlexNet. I said that there are um, first a set of convolutional layers. So let's walk through carefully what a convolutional layer is. So a convolutional layer is defined by, just like a regular layer, a weight and a bias. But the weight is actually a tensor. And it's a tensor of kernels of size K1 and K2. And those are typically small. And there's a number of input channels and a number of output channels. And then you have a bias vector. Now, what this does is it takes an input U to create some output tensor and it uses this kind of crazy formula here. This looks really complicated, but it's actually very simple in the following way. What you see is that the input tensor has some size, uh, and n here is the index over the input channels. And for each input channel, n, and for each output channel, m, it computes the convolution, or more precisely, the correlation of the kernel with the input. And then it adds it up over all the input channels, and that produces the output channel. And then it adds a bias. And so for each input-output channel pair, you really have one 2D filter of K1 by K2. So it's just like the convolutions that you have seen up to now, except that it's being repeated in this over this multi-channel uh, case. Now, after you do the convolutions, you usually follow some kind of data reduction stage before going to the next layer. Now, there are several ways to do that data reduction. The first way is just called subsampling, or, and what you do in subsampling is you take each region, say S by S, and you pick out one element, all right? And you just ignore all the other elements. And S is called the stride. 
in um, signal processing, you will know this as downsampling. The next type of data reduction method is called max pooling. And what you do is in each small k by k region, you just pick the maximum value in that region and then you stride over by S in horizontal and vertical direction. And I'll show you some pictures of that. A related method is called average pooling, and you compute some average in each K by K region and then stride over. This is sometimes called decimation in signal processing. And then what happens is either that the subsampling or max pooling or average pooling is applied on a per channel basis. All right, let's just illustrate max pooling. So here we have some image or section of an image. And if you do max pooling with say two by two filters and a stride of two, you divide, you first look in this first say two by two region here and you pick the largest number. So that's five. And then you stride over by two. So you go to this uh, blue colored area and you pick four and so on. Now here's uh, three by three, but with a side of two, stride of two. So in this three by three region, the largest is five. But then when you stride over, you will actually get overlap. All right, and uh, well, the value will depend on what these other pixels are here, but the largest out of these would be four. All right, so that's a pretty simple idea. And the kind of concept of it is that remember what the uh, features are doing, what the filtering is doing before is detecting features. And then it's by picking the maximum value, you're saying that that feature was detected somewhere in the vicinity of this uh, filtering. And then it's kind of by downsampling, you're getting a coarser um, localization of that feature. All right, now we've seen a little bit of what convolutional layers do. Let's go over to dense layers. So um, say that the last convolutional layer is of size B, which is the batch, and it's N1 and N2 for the size of each image and SC channels. What you typically do is you first flatten it. So you take all of those pixels in each um, sample and then you just create a B batch by an in size vector of the size of these products. So that's what flattening is. And then you just simply provide, perform a regular matrix multiplication, just like what we did in the previous unit. Basically you multiply it by some weight matrix and some add some biases depending on the output number of output channels. And that gives you a number of batch size of B and for the output and N out channels. All right, so it's the same as what we were doing in the last unit. The main reason you want to pick a convolutional layer versus a fully connected layer is that convolutional layers greatly reduce the number of parameters. So just to illustrate, Let's say that we're taking um, a layer with some batch size with N1 by N2 pixels per channel and N input channels. And we have N1 by M2 outputs with N out um, uh, channels. So for example, in the second layer of AlexNet, you have these parameters here, about 55 by 55 images with 96 channels going up to 256 channels. Now, if you just count the number of parameters that you would need to implement the filters, you will need in the weights K1 times K2 parameters for each filter, and you multiply them by the product of the input and output channels. And similarly, you have the out biases for the, um, the one bias per output channel. So if you do that math for this Alex let second layer of AlexNet, you get about 600,000 um, weights. All right, that sounds like a lot, but let's consider how many weights you would need for a fully connected layer. For a fully connected layer, you have, for every possible input, 
you would have and every possible output you would have a weight so you get the product of all six of these and that number would be something like 10 to the 11 or 2 times 10 to the 11 weight so it's orders of magnitude more so even though in principle every convolutional layer could be represented as a fully connected layer the convolutional layer is much more efficient in terms of the number of parameters and it's essentially exploiting this translational invariance the translational invariance is that it's trying to pick up the same feature throughout the whole image Okay, so that wraps up this section, and in the next section, we're going to jump into Keras and show you how to implement these convolutional layers in TensorFlow.